thank you to our show sponsors, FMC Preschool, U.S. Borax, and Adama Canada. While other sources of innovation run dry and fail to understand your needs, Adama is here to deliver. And we're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. Yes, back in the host seat. And I have so much news. I feel like it has been a very long time since I spoke with all of you. So wonderful to see everyone in the chat. Lots of familiar names there. Um, hello to all those who watch and never comment. Um, we still appreciate you being here. And please, tonight, maybe tonight will be the night you ask your question. Um, Kyler, I wanted to agree. Hats off to uh, producer Jay Strovey for that excellent music choice. I have to tell you, today is, of course, uh, the first Monday after the time change. I thought it should be easier, but of course I was very wrong. Um, and that just got me jazzed up and ready to roll. So yay. And I will say one of our guests tonight, of course, out of Saskatchewan, so does not have to change the time, but has to, of course, account for the rest of Canada doing so and, uh, and did so just fine. I know I would have been a mess. Okay. So uh, tonight, as always, does qualify for those CU credits. So if you collect them, please head on over tomorrow to realagriculture.com slash agronomists um, and let us know you took in the program and make sure you get those CEUs because today's will be a soil and water CEU. And that is a pretty tough one to get I uh, hear. All right. Uh, hello, Warren and Patrick. Ray is here. Jason's here out of Manitoba. Wonderful to see you all. Tonight's topic is, well, it can get as broad or as narrow as we want. We're going to take, we've got lots to cover, but we'll definitely take your questions on compaction, runoff, soil structure. And of course, we are going to talk uh, biological amendments. And that, of course, means manure, which, yay. All right. So for tonight's discussion, I have with me Dr. Jeff Shano at the University of Saskatchewan and Jake Monroe with OMAFRA. Welcome here, Jeff and Jake. Hello, Lindsay. It's great to be here. Yeah, glad to be here. All right. Okay. So to kick off uh, the evening, uh, Jeff, why don't you tell us what has been keeping you busy on the research front there uh, at the U of S? Well, I guess we've had a few projects that uh, tie around with your theme topic tonight of uh, uh, soil structure and water and uh, indeed manure as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, one thing that we've been looking at, it had a project just wrapping up this year, looking at uh, uh, how we can re restore or build productivity of eroded knolls. And another one that we've been uh, working on is uh, precision manure application and how we can make that uh, to be uh, agronomic and uh, environmentally beneficial uh, for everybody. And uh, we've also done some work uh, in the past on uh, compaction and uh, dealing with uh, compacted soils through subsoiling that uh, I think has some relevance to tonight's show as well, uh, uh, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Absolutely. So thank you for saying yes. Jeff, because if you had said no, I don't know who else I would find who's doing all the things you're doing. So there you go. And also, Jake, so Jake, huge thank you as well. Jake, you have a very important job happening right now, that of dad. And so yeah. thank you for taking time out um, of uh, these very precious early weeks of that and uh, joining us tonight. Um, eroded knolls, do we have any of those in Ontario? It seems like, you know, that's not a concern for us. Well, uh, it depends what part of Ontario you're in. But yes, we've got plenty of eroded knolls. And I'm, I'm very interested to hear the research out of Saskatchewan um, because we have growers do, doing that sort of, same sort of experimentation and, and moving topsoil. So yeah, very relevant for our province. That's right. So we are going to talk about that a, a bit. But Jake, I did want to uh, touch on, of course, uh, this past summer. What were some of the projects that you were working on? Yeah, so I've spent the last number of years looking looking at management of overwintering cover crops. So done a number, a uh, number of years work looking at soybeans and kind of high residue systems, planting soybeans into cereal rye that's roller crimped, um, planting it into, into just kind of plant green lighter stands of rye. And more recently kind of looking at some different options of overwintering species ahead of corn in either strip till or no-till systems. Um, but also I guess related to tonight's topic, I've, I'm on a, uh, team within the Ministry of Agriculture where we're working on a, a tool called the Soil Health Assessment and Plan. And that touches on and um, really is all about evaluating soil health on the farm, uh, hands-on and you know evaluating soil structure, uh, soil surface quality, 
you know, erosion potential, those sorts of things. So I'm sure we can, we can talk a bit about that tool as well as we go. Mm -hmm. All right. So many goodies. All right. So where, well, this is a good question. Do we start with, this is always the, the, the rub. Do we start with compaction? Do we start with erosion? Do we start with, you know, manure applications? There's no clear sort of path. So I'm going to just start with the question of, uh, I'll start with you, Jeff. How do you quantify uh, the losses that we might be facing when we're looking at something like eroding of knolls and removal of topsoil or moving of topsoil? How do, do we have a good sense of how valuable that topsoil is? Yeah, sure, Lindsay. So I guess when we think about uh, erosion here on the prairies, uh, a lot of the really severe erosion took place in the past. Uh, and sources of that erosion, maybe the first thing that comes to mind is wind erosion. That's the most visible, those dust storms. But also water erosion can move a lot of soil and so can tillage erosion and the good old force of gravity brings that soil downhill and so we end up with these soils uh, as a result particularly of years and years of uh, for example a wheat fallow tillage fallow rotation uh, moved a lot of that soil off of the knolls down into the depressions and so now we think about you know what kind of strategies could we use to build back up the productivity and it it's kind of part of precision agriculture because you're really dealing with a specific part of the field and managing it separately, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. Jake, what's the sense of it, similar idea? How much do you think something like a, a heavily eroded knoll is costing potentially in production? Yeah, it can be very costly. So again, depending on soil type and depending on the, the weather that we get in a given season, um, you know, you could be looking at, I'm just thinking of a specific example of a field that I that I know that you know, has, again, his, historical erosion, you know, largely caused by tillage, but exacerbated by, by water. And, you know, on a dry season, you know, your soybean yield might be, you know, in the, in the teens or maybe low 20s, if you're lucky, those sorts of areas of the field. And, and then you're pulling off, you know, 60 plus bushels, um, you know, in the draws and in the valleys. And so um, it's, it can be quite significant. The challenge, and maybe we can get into this discussion a little bit is, you know, not every grower wants to move to that, getting an earth mover or, or, or right. getting that topsoil up on those knolls. And so there are, um, I personally think that's a really neat approach. And I think, I think Jeff is going to show some data from that, but, uh, you know, what are some of the other strategies that could be enacted to help, uh, kind of optimize that system if you're not going to go that route? Yeah. Well, yeah, then sure. let's get to it. Let's, yeah, sure. Jake, you could be the host. I'll just hand it over. This is perfect. This is exactly what I wanted. Oh, no. And then I can just enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, yes. So let's, let's get to, because Jeff, you have looked at comparing some yep. of the different ways that we can do this. So, uh, producer Jay, if you could bring up, uh, Jeff's slides here, we'll start maybe at the beginning, but I think it's the, the third slide that has the, yep. the table sure. on it. But if we start at the beginning, uh, Jeff, can you just sort of absolutely Maybe lay sure. out what you did here yeah sure so this is a study in south central saskatchewan actually it's on one of my farm fields that had experienced a lot of erosion in the past before we got into no-till and uh, uh, started to build our soils up and improve them and uh, this uh, still suffered i guess you might say from some some past sins way back in the past uh, lost soils so we've got a number of different amendments that we looked at and the one thing you can see in those picture is those uh, black piles out there and those are actually small plots that have been treated with topsoil about 10 centimeters of topsoil that was brought out of the depressional areas and put back on there as one of the treatments along with treatments of commercial fertilizer like uh, phosphorus and micronutrients alone and in combination and also solid cattle manure and uh, actually that's a picture there in the bottom of my spouse Lynn with the old 4010 uh, helping bring some of that uh, soil out of the out of the sloughs up onto the upslopes and that kind of became our our top control and really inspired by by work that's going on at the University of Manitoba Dr. David Lobb and uh, his cohorts uh, uh, to look at this whole aspect of of topsoil restoration but also some other amendments as well next slide mm -hmm. please 
Yeah. So one of the things that we do, I mean, we measure yield on there. We measure nutrient uptake and residual nutrients. But I know we're talking in this uh, show here, Lindsay, about uh, uh, about soil structure and, and tilth and water relations. So one of the things that we do in a lot of our studies, regardless of what we're looking at, in addition to measuring the, the nutrients, is we like to take a look at water. And here we're measuring water infiltration in the field using what's called a, a double ring infiltrometer. So we got two rings of steel there. We fill them up with water. The idea of having two rings is we got water in the outside ring and it stops the water from moving outwards so that in that center ring, we can watch the level of the water drop down. And that's what's called the infiltration rate, the rate of water entry. Next slide. So this is what we found in the uh, first year. Uh, Dr. Ryan Hangs is my research associate working on this project. And he was doing a number of measurements and this water infiltration was one of them. And you can see there uh, the, uh, the, what we call the saturated hydraulic conductivity, which is a fancy term for water infiltration or water entry, our untreated control, and even our soil that was treated our surface with one application of manure really didn't have much effect on infiltration. I think it takes a few applications of manure mm -hmm. to build that structure up and change it to the point where we're going to see more infiltration. But over there on the right, that topsoil replacement was by and far the king in water entry. And also mm -hmm. in terms of other properties as well, structural properties of the soil, uh, really shows that it's really hard uh, to uh, replace that topsoil, folks, once it's gone and all the benefits that it, that it provides. So the last slide on this, please. This is in that first year. And uh, you can see all of our treatments there compared to the control on the left side. And some of them gave more or less, uh, uh, you know, yield response there, like the monoammonium phosphate fertilizer, uh, the micronutrients. The SCM I've circled there because the cattle manure, that stands for solid cattle manure, right out of a, out of a, out of a pen of my neighbors that we put on the top of that hill, actually was a leader and has been in the years since 2021 and 2022. But again, we see that that topsoil on, on top. Interestingly, in 2022, which was the uh, third year after application of those treatments in the spring of 2020, we actually start to see some of those other fertilizer amendments actually starting to produce a yield that started to approach what we were seeing with the manure and the topsoil. Mm -hmm. So it took some time, but hey, uh, but still, uh, I, you know, we have a tough time getting back to that uh, that good old topsoil in terms of okay. what it can do. No kidding. Okay, so Jay, leave this up for a bit because Jake, I'd love to get sort of your thoughts on this. And and I am glad I asked before we went live what the SCM stood for because I, I couldn't. But that's the solid cattle manure. So there we you go. Bet. That's what that is. There we go. So this is, so Jake, what are you thinking in looking at this? I mean, and hearing that, you know, over time, like to me, that's this putting of topsoil back on some of these eroded places i mean that's not an insignificant amount of work but clearly it makes a huge difference i i guess that yeah absolutely and there's i know that there's other work as mentioned you know work done at the university of manitoba there's been work done decades past in canada looking at this sort of approach as well and and some on-farm trials here in ontario and i guess that the big thing that comes to mind for me is is m moisture retention and helping you know that crop get through dry conditions and so just maybe a question back to jeff like uh how was 2020 for moisture in your area 2020 wasn't bad 2021 was brutal mm -hmm. for the drought and so how uh, did they compare in 21 then? well how did the 21 we got we got a uh we got we still got a we, we got a very good response of the topsoil it was still king of the hill <laughs> so to yeah. speak 2022 was better still dry but we started to get more moisture then especially in the spring of the year and i think maybe that helped that crop root down a little bit and access some of those fertilizer nutrients that we'd added but the other thing that happened in 2022 uh bad grasshoppers so mm -hmm. our, our straw yields reflected more the effect than the grain yields because the hoppers came in and on the canola later on and they uh, they raised the licking on the on the seed yield. <sighs> I do not like grasshoppers. I'll be honest. Uh, yeah, at all. So now the the flip side to this is, of course, and and you're right, Jake. There's you know there's this work. There's other work that's been done, and we're we're trying to understand all of these different components. But one of the key things, and Jeff, you've mentioned it, is that 
if we don't move the topsoil from the high points to the low points to begin with, that's sort of the point, right? Is that if we yeah. have good topsoil, let's leave it there. Exactly. Whatever we can do to keep that topsoil in place, this really shows the value of it. And I mean, you know, talking about yields there, we're looking at, at grain yields on that topsoil on the right hand side compared to that unfertilized control there that, you know, are probably 40 percent greater. So as uh, Jake talked about, you know, how do you put a value on that? Depends on what crop. And we've seen this benefit in here. We've had spring wheat. We've had canola on there. Uh, you know, that 40 uh, percent yield benefit is, is, is not uncommon that we've seen in, in in replicates that we have of these knolls. But uh, I think the one thing I'd like to point out is actually the, the legume, the peas, didn't show as much of an effect. And the reason why is because those peas are pretty good scavengers of nutrients under low fertility conditions, and they can fix the nitrogen that they need through biological fixation in the nodules on their roots. So peas weren't as responsive to, this, uh, to these treatments as we saw with wheat and canola. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jason Vogt out of Manitoba, who of course also experienced the drought in 21, says 100% the soils with manure application were able to produce a crop in 2021, which really was the difference for some areas. Now, Jake, you of course, this past year was very dry for many parts of Ontario. Um, Ontario has the benefit of perhaps more dairy, more hog, more poultry manure applied uh, in some areas. What what sort of resilience did you see uh, this past summer? Yeah, this is a comment that I got from a number of, of agronomists. Um, really, you know, and again, depended on the part of the province. And I know in, in the east, they, they didn't, you know, struggle as much with the dry conditions. Uh, you know, where I live in Guelph and kind of the surrounding Waterloo, Wellington area was the driest of pretty well as all of southern Ontario. Um, but we certainly had, you know, pretty long stretch with very minimal precipitation. And overwhelming comment I've heard is, you know, actually from agronomists as well as growers themselves that you know the, the good soil management practices really showed this year so help get that crop through you know whether it's you know not that corn not showing moisture stress not pineappling as quickly same with soybeans you know leaf curling um like that sort of it's not that you know um it's not that a good soil is going to get you out of no rainfall whatsoever. I think we all know that, but it's about getting through those stressful periods and helping to keep as much of that yield potential as possible. And so, mm -hmm. you know, and that's even more important for corn, especially earlier on in the season or as we head to tassel. So that's what I both heard and saw myself as, you know, uh, areas with good rotation areas with um, manure being regularly applied where they're taking care of their soils in that way um, out yielded their neighbors this year. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Mr. Ray DeBanco, Jeff, you may have heard this name before, you has bet. a question for you. Yes. Uh, expectation on any differences in these results, if it was dairy cattle manure, I like that you've abbreviated that for us, right? As opposed to solid <laughs> beef cattle manure. So how, how might the makeup of dairy manure change things? Yeah, you might see a difference there. And the reason why is because if you're talking about liquid dairy cattle, cattle manure or liquid hog manure, there isn't as much organic matter in that compared to immediately available nutrients. The solid beef cattle manure, the penning manure, adds a lot of organic matter directly to the soil. And organic matter is really key when it comes to structure, holding moisture, promoting infiltration, and I guess kind of giving that resiliency against drought. So uh, whereas, you know, if a really, really nutrient deficient conditions, high demanding crop, lots of rainfall, Fall, you might see that liquid manure be as good a performer, maybe better than that solid manure, because the solid manure releases its nitrogen actually quite slowly compared mm -hmm. to the, the the liquid manure. But uh, but you know under under uh, a drought condition, uh, I think that 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 organic matter, and if you think about it, providing a bit of a surface cover on that soil, uh, protecting it against evaporation. Yeah, I think it would. I think that it would be the it would be the winner. So yeah, depends on the conditions, which would come out on top. We saw, you know, the cattle manure really perform well under those dry conditions. And I'm, I'm also going to say, Ray, there aren't a heck of a lot of dairy cows in 
Saskatchewan anymore. So it's a little harder to get that dairy manure than it is to get some beef manure. So there is that. Um, all right. Okay. We are very quickly, I want to just quickly jump to our first clip uh, with Marla Reichman from a couple of years ago. Uh, this is at Canola School talking about, because I want to flip this. Uh, someone said in the comments, you can't erode what you're compacting. So I want to switch gears to compaction <laughs> for just a little bit. Uh, but producer Jay, if you could uh, run the clip. Well, so the first thing with soil compaction that people need to understand is that um, when you have moist soils, when we're there near field capacity, that is when you're at your highest risk of compaction. So what happens is all of the big pores that you have are filled with air and the tiny little pores um, between the soil spaces are filled with water. So the water filled pores can't go anywhere. They don't squish down, but the big pores with air, they squish and compact. And when you take those big pores out, you restrict the ability for roots to grow through them. You restrict, once you restrict roots, you don't have those fine root hairs that are growing effectively in them. You start to affect some of the larger microorganisms that are trying to move through those soils. And so by doing so, it basically can start decreasing yield or affecting the, the crop negatively. What sort of tips do you have for farmers then? You know, you said you can't stay out of the field, but then what do you, what do you do? So, so we need to think about being a bit more deliberate when we go into the field, when we know we're at high risk. So if it's dry and you're at low risk of compaction, we don't really have to think about it. But if we are dealing with high risk situations, moist soils in the spring when we're trying to seed or in the fall when we've had these wet falls, when we're trying to harvest, even when we're trying to spray in the middle of the summer, if we have these wet soils, we need to think about what can I do to decrease that risk? So one of the things that you might do is to travel less across the field. So if your issue is you're going across the field and um, we use this line that we say 80% of compaction happens in the first pass. So if you were going over, the, uh, over a field four times in a row, and you considered after that fourth time that to be 100% of total compaction, 80% happened the very first time you went across it. So if that's happening, if we're just driving randomly over a field, then that's not necessarily a good situation. So maybe we wanna start being a bit more deliberate on how we travel. So if we know we're trying to get across a field, maybe for most of the time, if we can stay in the same track, then we're compacting it heavily, you know, more heavily, but at least not as bad as if we just randomly were driving across. So a good example would be something like going out with a grain cart. And if you're heading out to meet with the combine, uh, if you're just, you know, driving randomly across the field, that's going to show up and yield the next year. And you can quite often see this through aerial photographs, these random lines of light green where, where the wheel tracks are and the crop isn't doing as well. So, we want to think about where we travel, how often we travel across the same spot, um, how often we just randomly travel across the field. We want to do things like make sure that our tire pressure is appropriate for field conditions. So if you're going out with your uh, tractor, you want to make sure that your tire pressure isn't too overinflated. You want um, appropriate uh, tire pressure. So talk to your tire people, make sure that you've got it run at the rated pressure and that will decrease the overall impact. Uh, use tracks if they're available to you, if you have tracks. If you've got tracks versus duels, there's not a real difference. As long as your tires are at their proper inflated pressure, then there's not really an advantage of tracks in terms of compaction. There may be other advantages that you're looking at, but the compaction will be about the same. Um, and then really we need to think about the weight of equipment that we travel across the field. So. We used to travel across the field with a grain truck and skinny little tires, and then we moved to grain carts because we figured that that would be more appropriate. And it is to a point, but the grain carts got bigger and bigger and bigger, and they get heavier and heavier and heavier as that happens. And when we drive soil compaction deeper, so axle load, the heavier the equipment gets, the deeper the soil kind of experiences the compaction, that can be driven three to four feet into the ground. There's not a whole lot we can do about that. And so we need to go across maybe with lighter soil or lighter equipment if we can. So Our sponsors for The Agronomist are Adama Canada, FMC Preschool and US Borax. Understanding the interplay of macro and micronutrients is important when choosing fertilizer products and agricultural practices. The ag team at US Borax are experts in boron's role in soil and plant health, including how boron deficiency can limit yield even when sufficient macronutrients are applied to the soil. Backed by decades of field research and lab studies, we can provide recommendations tailored for your specific soil solution. Go to borax.com radio for more information. I have been making note 
of all the words I may need to explain to people because this is a national program. So I've realized that we were saying carts and uh, we have to mention buggies and we should probably mention um, what a slew is. Anyway, mm -hmm. I realized that maybe not everyone knows what a slew is. Um, anyway, so if anybody has any questions about the vernacular, please do ask. We love to uh, share the knowledge here. Okay, so a couple things from that one. Um, I love that. Now that's from a few years ago. I love that Marla um, hesitates to say we have to think about the heft of what's driving across the field or how many trips we make because there, we we all recognize that farming happens in the growing season. The growing season is a set number of days. We don't always know how many we have, and time is of the essence. And so, how do we sort of match up? exactly those things of managing that risk with recognizing sometimes things have to get done. So Jeff, maybe I'll start with you. How, how do we get that point across on the compaction side? Yeah, well, I guess when you think about how soil conditions can influence that, uh, wet soils, uh, high clay content, low organic matter, really conducive to uh, uh, compacting that soil, uh, destroying the structure. Uh, and, and it's not just only just the compaction, the down pressure, but also the kind of smearing that creates uh, when wheels are spinning uh, that can really uh, raise heck with, uh, with the structure of that soil. And so, I mean, you say, yeah, you, you, you know, avoid going out into the, into the field at those, uh, at those times when possible, certainly. Uh, as Marla mentioned, you know, you, you want to keep that, that weight down and increase that uh, surface area that you've got uh, to distribute that weight across through tracks or through uh, duels or, or triples. Those are all, all, all effective ways. I guess one of the things that, that we've looked at in, in our research work uh, previously is uh, when you do have a compacted area in a field that's been compacted, for example, by repeated wheel traffic like a haul road or maybe an area in a field entry entry area, you know, is there something that, that can be done about that? And to this end, we've done some research on, uh, I guess, what we would call precision subsoiling uh, to address uh, compacted areas that we identify within specific areas of the field. So Jake, I guess that's my question to you as well. I mean, hearing with Marla saying, you know, deep compaction can happen several feet down. Do we, are we using something like, you know, subsoiling or or a ripper or those sorts of things? Are we using it strategically? Are we using the, them well? I don't know if I can make that generalization for, you know, for all the province or for all growers. I, I, in my experience, I, I know it's um, it's a regular, you know, practice for some growers and then others, you know, as Jeff is alluding to with his research are, are a little more strategic in terms of, you know, in terms of also the cost and the fuel required to, to run mm -hmm. that piece of equipment yeah. and making sure that it's worthwhile and also making sure um, my colleague Sebastian Belliard had a had a good segment, I think, in the twenty twenty one diagnostic days, where he looked uh, with Paul Sullivan at uh, at some subsoiling that was done in eastern Ontario, and looking at whether the the fracturing that was wanted that they were getting at was actually you know achieved. And you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot to that in terms of making sure that that job is is done properly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so so it can be a good tool, but I, I know there's other things we're going to talk about as well that can be, you know, I, I think for the field as a whole you know the probably more cost effective and more beneficial for a wide variety of you know, soil functions um you know, some of the kind of bmps that we often talk about can really be beneficial in terms of reducing compaction risk and helping to ameliorate it mm -hmm. um i in in prepping for tonight's show i did go through a couple other videos and one of them was mr peter johnson talking about how wheat shows all and so how, if you want to find where your compaction is or those sorts of things, just grow a wheat crop and it will show you exactly where everything is um, and point it all out for you. And, and certainly, you know, we had some good visuals of headlands and, you know, where we've got high traffic areas, field entrances, those sorts of things where, you know, yes, you can try to stick to a similar track or the same track for some passes, but obviously, you know, the ins and out of the field are going to become heavily compacted where returning equipment can become heavily compacted if conditions are right. So we do have to have some strategies, as you mentioned, Jake, for that. So, uh, so let's talk about how we can, or if we can, assess our fields. So this is really neat, Jake, but I want to state for the record that um, 
we can't visually assess forage quality, but apparently we can visually assess soil quality. And I just don't think that's fair. So I'm just <laughs> stating that for the record. Um, but, but I guess that's the question, Jay. Can we visually assess soil? What can it tell us? What are the limitations? Yeah, so I'd mentioned the soil health assessment and plan a SHAP tool that we're developing. And a part of that, this is not our this is not our program or our evaluation, but the visual evaluation of soil structure, it's been around for a number of years now. It's been used in, in research um, to provide, uh, put some numbers to soil structure, uh, you, know, uh, you know, being able to say, is this a well-structured soil and actually assign it a score? So maybe Jay, if you could bring up that, perfect. Um, just to give an example of what, that scoring might look like. So here from the visual evaluation of soil structure, um, this is an SQ1 that would be considered the top score. That's very good, uh, you know, uh, very good tilt, very friable soil. And that would be the sort of soil that we see in an exceptionally managed agricultural field, but more often, you know, a fence row or, uh, you know, a grassland. Um, SQ3 might be what we'd more commonly see, at least in Ontario, in our agricultural soils. And so you could, you know, it's not a super large photo, but you can probably tell even from there, it's chunkier, you know, that's been broken apart, but it's still remaining in some larger chunks. Um, but it's not massive or uh, doesn't have massive structure or very large blocks, as you can see in SQ5. So that would be, you know, that's where we're getting into quite compacted soil. Um, we heard about porosity and the importance of pore space mm -hmm. for roots, for air exchange. And the closer you are to that SQ1 score, the more air exchange and root exploration is happening and the happier your crop is going to be. And so if you can go to the next slide there, Jay, you can see this is just an example of, of some of the, of one Ontario field uh, where I did a visual evaluation of cell structure and the, without going into the details of how you do it, it's quite, quite straightforward. And even if you weren't to use the whole process and the scoring, you could go out with a shovel and do this yourself, you know, as a grower and and get a sense of what your soil is looking like relative to some, some of these photos. So you would basically take a chunk of soil out with a spade, you know, put it on a on a clean surface and take a look at where the soil naturally fractures. And that can tell you about past tillage depths. And as I mm -hmm. as I started digging in some different fields and also spoken to some growers who've done the same um, even some growers who've moved to no-till a number of years ago, uh, you will find that past tillage shows up in in this when you just dig out a spade full of soil. And so in this particular field, this is a no-till strip till farm. It's been in that system for six or seven years. Um, you can see here the, you know, the depth of, you know, historical tillage, whether it was cult cultivation, disking or plowing, um, you know, that, that showed up very easily when I was pulling that soil apart. And then on the right hand side, you can see with VES, you you basically gently break the soil apart. And this is this would be on the top, that top layer, that uh, darker soil. That'd be, you know, a two, two and a half. That's that's a pretty decent soil. Uh, not like a fence row, but that's a pretty decent agricultural soil that's gonna be fairly productive. You could do one more advanced slide there, Jay. And so just finally, in terms of what we would, you know, not wanna see in our fields and, and just going back to that conversation about you know, compaction and uh, Jeff, you mentioned smearing in terms of in terms of tires under wet conditions, but also smearing in terms of tillage action. Here's an example of a field. This is in Brant County, Ontario, and it's uh, it's being managed by a grower who's very conscientious. Um, you can see there's some cover crop there. There was a wheat crop growing, trying to do you know the right thing and reduce tillage and all that. But actually, he's dealing with some some historical compaction. Happened to be a dairy farm. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of equipment being going onto that uh, field over the years, and a lot of tillage being done, and and that on the right hand side is what we call platy structure. And in that case, you can't see it that well in the photo, but it was restricting root growth. So you know this mm -hmm. grower had put out a cover crop with the hopes of getting you know getting those roots down deeper to help the crop the following year. And although he's still certainly getting some benefit from that cover crop, he's not getting the same level of growth perhaps that he mm -hmm. might have expected, and he's not. You're not really getting as, at least at that time of year, hadn't really gotten too deep into that cell profile because of that uh, that root restrictive layer. So, 
That, Jake, yeah, those are the seven things you can do. Go ahead, Jake. Jeff. You mentioned you mentioned forages, you know, which I think are, are a really great way over time to build up organic matter, build some root channels to get water going down. What about earthworms? You, have you folks got earthworms in your soil out there? And and any yeah, thoughts sure on do. that? Yeah. Yeah, uh, actually, I've got a couple slides on earthworms. Could you uh, move forward three slides, Jay? And we can just take a quick look at some some signs of earthworms. You know, I'm I'm kind of surprised sometimes because it's it's sort of my world and i'm sure jeff it's it, very much your world um you know thinking about the soil biology and what goes on there um but i'm surprised every now and again i'll chat with a grower and i'll we'll be walking in the field and i'll point out something on the surface of the soil and, and say do you know what that is and 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 they're not always quite sure of uh, of what i'm referring to and so i've i've included a photo on the left hand side there and i've drawn some yellow circles around earthworm middens. So that's where deep burrowing earthworms, yeah, and yes, we do have lots of them in well-managed fields, uh, Jeff, mm -hmm. um, are, you know, have taken up residence. Uh, this is a, this is a minimum till, largely no-till, minimum till field with a pretty good crop rotation. It sees organic amendments every few years. And it's, you know, as you can see, this grower has built up a very healthy earthworm population. And, okay. And so, yes, go ahead. So hang on. So I love earthworms. Um, but what do they do? So is it really, is it about the channels that they build? Is it about the material they cycle? Is it all of those things? Why do we love them? Okay. I'll go quickly first and then Jeff add, a, add anything else that you want to. So yeah, there's, there's kind of litter dwelling earthworms, there's surface dwelling earthworms, and then there's deep burrowing earthworms, Lemurcus terrestris, which I've shown there. That's basically their food source, their, those middens in the yellow circles. So your question, Lizzie, what do they do? Why do we like them? I'll just talk about the deep burrowing earthworms. We like them because they create porosity. They create macropores in the soil, and that helps water infiltrate quickly, especially when we get a heavy rainfall. That also helps um, create basically kind of highways for roots, for you know corn roots, soybean roots to, to be able to follow. And those burrows are rich in nutrients because of the casts within them. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, for deep burrowing earthworms like that, it's all about, you know, creating those macropores and, and channels for, for water and roots and, and the surface, more surface drilling ones, they're also creating porosity, but again, more right in the topsoil. Yeah. You know, when you think about, uh, about cycling and, and decomposition, which is really important in, in getting nutrients back into available forms that, that plants can use. And I know I say, first thing maybe comes to mind is bacteria and fungi. Sometimes we forget about the soil macrofauna and mm. all the other organisms that are there, like earthworms and, and other uh, 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 organisms that uh, sometimes you can see with the naked eye unlike the bacteria and, and for example mm -hmm. but are still really really important in starting that whole decomposition process to release those nutrients uh, back into available forms that uh, plants can can use again so Lindsay, Jay, can I, 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 oh, oh yeah no, go, go ahead, ahead. Well, I just, I was just wanted just to add say, on to that because I've got a prop, but you go ahead first. Okay. <laughs> well, I was going to say, I want to leave this up because it, it ties into, or I want to use this as an example for Kevin's question. So Canadian Cameron, um, Canadian Cameron wants to know about how much compaction rainfall can cause. So does rainfall cause compaction or does rainfall bust up aggregates or is it both? What, what are we worried about there? Um, but Jake, I don't want to stray too far if we have props that involve earthworms, because obviously I want that. <laughs> Can we hold so, that question for just one minute yes, and then, yes, and then I'll would... be right back. Just one second. Okay, great. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to say my, if it were me, I would prefer the picture on the left than the right if I'm having a rainstorm. But anyway, okay, Jake, yeah, yeah. what so, do you got? I'm glad that, um, that you mentioned Jeff about, um, us, not us as growers or the ag sector in general, we don't often think of those larger organisms we we do talk about earthworms to be fair quite a bit at least yeah. in ontario um but we don't really talk a lot about all the other critters that are kind of living in the soil or on top of the mm -hmm. soil ground beetles um springtails there's there's a whole bunch of them and so i wanted to we have we have you know different field days uh, throughout the summer here and we we want visuals sometimes to show um growers and other participants and so what i did is i buried I buried just a couple of maple leaves and I used a very tight mesh and I used a very loose mesh. And so the loose mesh allowed the, those larger critters to get in and, and kind of work away at that. 
And our crop residue, residue recycling is so important and we rely on a lot of those larger bugs. And so I'll just show you the, the larger mesh here. You can see there's basically nothing in it. Um, this yeah. is the one I left it out for two weeks or sorry, two months, I should say two months, uh, that maple leaf disappeared. Uh, I had a smaller mesh that, you know, this wouldn't have stopped bacteria and fungi. I got to put it in the right Yeah, direction. there you go. Yeah, it's yeah. Right yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, um, this would not have stopped those microorganisms, but the macroorganisms couldn't get in. This mesh was too small. And so it's it remained entirely intact and didn't break down huh. at all. And, and when we yeah. think about, you know, the issues yeah. that we have with corn residue breaking down, right? That's yeah. a big concern for us in Ontario for no-till soybeans. Um, those critters are doing that work. And if we don't have an environment that supports them, uh, we might have some residue issues. So I uh, just wanted to follow up on that, but now we can move to yeah. Kevin's question. I love that. Yeah. Okay. Um, that is fantastic. And probably a whole other show. Uh, okay. So Jeff, let's, let's launch with the discussion of rainfall. So, so Kevin specifically, of course, he's, so he's in the Fraser Valley. He gets a lot of rain October to April. So are we concerned about the impact of rainfall on our soils? On unprotected soil, I think it's a combination of both. And uh, really what happens is you've got an actual uh, impact effect of that raindrop that uh, uh, can break the particles apart and uh, cause some 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 dispersion uh, if they're unprotected if there's no organic matter there residue on the surface to to uh, reduce the 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 impact force of that drop it can it can break apart the the the, the particles and cause them to disperse and uh, uh, just just the force of the of the rainfall itself has a kind of a of a compacting effect so it's not uncommon uh, in unprotected soil that has no residue cover and low organic matter and I saw this for myself back in the 1970s and 80s out in summer fallow fields tilled no residue left that you would not only see a, a crust develop on the surface but also that soil was denser down deeper and so when you went in with your tillage tool it took more horsepower and fuel to get through it mm -hmm. so now so kevin i know grows a lot of forage um certainly some fall rye and those sorts of things so does it have to be is it better to have say that that living root system because of course he does not get winter like the rest of us um or is it is it so long as there is residue and decent cover are we minimizing that well i think those roots help myself uh, along with that residue cover what do you think jake yeah i agree that you know we, we do talk about yeah 30 30 percent cover through until you know the, uh, after planting's done that's kind of what we we look for to minimize erosion, but that doesn't mean that there's no erosion happening, or it doesn't mean that there's no compaction happen. You know, um, that impact of rain is still hitting that soil if there is some bare soil. So, you know, within within your production system and what makes sense, you know, the more cover, you know, live and dead residue, the better. You know, over that period of time, that non-growing season. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps. Uh, Kevin. Now, all right. So Kyle has a question here, and I, I'm going to rephrase it somewhat differently. In that, there he's he's saying that he had a meeting with a company that is uh, wants to sell a product that is a foliar product that they're saying is going to eliminate compaction in some way. So I'm going to back that up a bit and say, what do we know about alleviating compaction over time? As in, if we know we've got, say, that smear layer or a plow pan or those sorts of things, what are the BMPs? What are the tools to actually alleviate or, or remediate that? Jake, I'll start with you. Sure. So, yeah, I, I'll, I'll answer the. I, I won't address the the product part. I'll just talk yeah, about. I yeah, don't expect. The, to. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah. What you know. And I think maybe Jeff, you're going to show us. You, you did allude to it. Maybe afterwards, you show us your data. But you know, I think strategic and and well, you know, well done tillage to get down underneath that restrictive layer, open it up, and then get a root system growing. You know, to exploit that that opening. That's certainly one of the ways that can can be effective in helping to ameliorate and, and address past compaction. You know, just having you know a root system. Uh, and certain species, and, and it's by no means a silver bullet, but there are certain species, you know, the tillage radish is, is promoted, you know, that way, um, you know, as, a, as, as kind of a tillage tool in the sense that it, it does have a 
a root that go, can go down deep, but there are other species as well that, you know, uh, if you're growing them at a time of year that, where you've got moisture kind of through the soil profile and you're taking advantage of those kind of moisture conditions where the roots can maybe create some fracture, um, that's where, that's where roots can have a benefit. Um, deep rooted perennials can also, um, have a, have a benefit over time in terms of addressing that deeper compaction, you know, the strength of, you know, like alfalfa's top root, for example. Uh, but maybe pass it over to Jeff for other, other options. Yeah, sure. So, uh, I alluded to some work that we did, uh, in uh, some soils in southern Saskatchewan, two different soil types. Uh, one was a chernozem, that's a pretty well structured soil to begin with. The other soil is a solanets, and a solanets is a soil that already comes with some structural limitations: a hard bat, a hard pan, B horizon, dispersion of the of, of of the soil particles because of sodium, and and generally kind of kind of conducive to compaction to begin with. So Jay, if I can get you to put a put my first slide up there, that would be slide number twelve. My set we're gonna switch over here hang on it'll just take a second i was just gonna say i was looking through and i think yes it's number 12 j uh, it's it's the subsoiling one i think right yeah that's it there so yeah so you can see in the background of that picture there in the left hand side that we had some long-term haul roads in this field where trucks have been going through and hauling the grain out uh, from a, an area there wasn't any access roads through and we also created some some compaction by running a a, a three-ton truck filled up with grain uh, across an area about three or four times and uh, we created these kind of zones that that we were then able to identify as being above of the critical limit using a penetrometer, a cone penetrometer. And that's what the fellow's uh, doing down there in the bottom uh, uh, left-hand corner. And then we said, well, okay, we can identify these areas using penetration resistance or soil strength. And then can we get in and can we do some subsoiling? And we and we want to do it in a minimum disturbance manner. We don't want to be have a whole lot of surface disturbance. So in this research work, we used various minimum till subsoilers that you can see there, low profile shank doesn't create a lot of surface disturbance but at the bottom there's a mole there a kind of a, of a plowshare that lifts that soil and creates a loosening action so we applied this out in the field and if i can have the next slide there jay and this was on the solenetic soil and over there on the right hand side we've got the the scenario no compaction no subsoiling and this is our canola yield that's the orange bar on the right. And then we have this long-term wheel traffic compacted area and no subsoiling. That's the orange bar there on the left. Significant yield reduction. And you can see there when we subsoiled that long-term wheel traffic compacted area, we got a significant yield benefit there. In fact, I think it was, if you we had about a 12 bushel per acre increase in canola yield. And if you work that out at $18 a bushel of canola, that's pretty good. But it's you know, good. that's... That's just those areas. The rest of the field, we really saw no benefit from the subsoiling there. In fact, maybe even, although not statistically significant, maybe even a slight trend towards a yield decrease kind there of, because yeah. it just didn't quite leave the soil in as good a physical shape at the surface for that seed bed for the for the canola and this agrees with some earlier work that we did on irrigated that you know unless that soil is above that critical limit uh, you're not going to benefit from it and really you know the kind of, of compaction widespread compaction across the fields that we worked with in Saskatchewan we really didn't see a lot of evidence of of severe compaction and one of the things that we have here in the prairie that really helps us out, folks, is uh, uh, these freeze-thaw cycles uh, that are frequent, a spring of the year, fall of the year. They're the same thing that bust ups our highways. They break up the pavement, but they also help to loosen that soil naturally, too. They mostly bust up my pavement around my place, Jeff. I'll be <laughs> honest. So we're in full-on pothole season. Okay, just quickly, I do want to talk a bit more about manure, uh, but we are going to go to our last sponsor read for the night, and then uh, we'll wrap up our conversation. Our sponsors for the agronomists are Adama Canada, U.S. Borax, and FMC Preschool. Weeds constantly evolve, but so can your integrated pest management strategies. Knowing the latest weed pressures, resistance trends, application techniques, management strategies, herbicide science, and more gives you the tools for a proactive, agronomically responsible response. 
Go to www.fmcpreschool.com for recorded webinars from field experts and curated articles. fmcpreschool.com, your knowledge, your business, your success. All right. Okay. So um, a few last things I want to touch on here. So to, to go back to sort of part of this discussion of alleviating compaction. So A, our goal is to try and decrease it as much as we can for one thing. Uh, but that what, I, what I'm hearing, so tell me if I'm wrong though, is that there is no easy fix. We have to be strategic and we have to think long-term with rotation, rooting depth, all of those things. That sounds f like far more work, gentlemen. I'll be honest. I would much prefer it be easy. Just like so but... many things out there, Lindsay. <laughs> yep. It ain't easy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. So, but one of the things, and I think Jason, you had asked earlier about what do you consider a soil amendment? And so, of course, on this show, I make no secret of how much I love manure and it's magical. It's brown gold. Um, it obviously is the soil amendment we think of the soil amendment we think of the most, but it is not the only. Uh, we do have some other options. Um, so manure, compost, we have biosolids, there are other things that we can add. So um, Jeff, maybe I'll start with you. I do want to talk a bit about manure because we've got some good slides on, on that as well. But what might some of these other soil amendments be um, that are potentially going to be changing our soil structure or organic matter, these sorts of things? Yeah, so uh, you mentioned that, uh, you know, not just fresh manure, but but composted manure. Uh, there's some other things out there. Uh, one are chars, biochar is something that, that we hear a lot about. And it's it's kind of like a, a synthetic organic matter in the sense that uh, that it's uh, uh, predominantly carbon. Uh, it contains nutrients often, but sometimes those nutrients are are locked in a, in a very unavailable form and they have charge. And so they can actually help retain nutrients under very high loss conditions, uh, extreme leaching conditions. Uh, those chars can can help hang on to uh, nitrogen ions, uh, phosphate, uh, uh, for example, and, and help keep it in place. And that can be a can be a benefit. Um, also, um, uh, as well, even as as uh, uh, we can think of of of, of other types of amendments that can be byproducts. Uh, we did a lot of work with uh, uh, some biofuel uh, uh, production byproducts and and found actually things like um, um, excess uh, uh, thin stillage uh, left behind from ethanol production was actually oh, yeah. a, a really good source of nutrient, behaves similar to, uh, to liquid swine manure. Um, yeah, and and even I guess if you if you think about you know even about amendments as as being the the enhanced efficiency uh, products that you can add to the soil that are going to inhibit the activity of of enzymes uh, uh, like urease and nitrification uh, enzymes and help keep that nitrogen in the soil those could also be considered uh, amendments as as well. So lots of different ones that 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 play a different role and really the trick I think in in in, in kind of you know, is is the how they're managed has a lot to do with how well they work. Just like so many things, how much you put on, when you put it on, uh, how you put it on, the source. So kind of the four R's tie into all of those amendments as well. Absolutely. So and and uh, Kyler's got a really great question here. Um, but Jake, I just want to quickly ask, what is the most interesting soil amendment you've heard of? I'd I'd never heard of the stillage before. Jake, what about oh, I've, what I've got the most interesting one I've heard of is oh. probably the anaerobic digestate produced from zoo animals from the Toronto Zoo. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have heard wow. about that one before, but, no. but they, they've got a digester apparently at the Toronto Zoo, yeah. and and yeah, they they're producing okay. digestate from that. So that from that. That's coming from many different sorts of animals. So that would be a neat one. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah, that would be incredibly interesting. Okay, so just quickly, because I do want to touch a bit on, you know, um, can is there such thing as precision applications of manure? Uh, but Kyler's got a good question, and I'll put it to both of you. Um, for solid manure, are there solid manure versions of the liquid manure dribble bars? Um, because some of them are pushing 40 to 45 meters in width now okay so um <laughs> koala, ray debanko says koala poop koala poop rules apparently <laughs> i was thinking more like zebras and chimps but who knows all right so does anyone know do we know of any solid manure versions of uh like a dribble bar anyone you go ahead jeff i i don't know mm -hmm. nothing specifically that i think of as a commercial unit but we did 
work. I worked with Prairie Agriculture Machinery Institute in the College of Engineering here at U of S, and uh, they they developed a uh, solid manure injector unit that would mm -hmm. inject solid manure in bands. And uh, uh, it had its challenges, but but uh, we were able to do research work with that and uh, look at its effect on crop growth and also things like, like nutrient runoff. Uh, we saw some benefits from putting solid manure in the ground versus the surface, but they generally weren't as large as with the liquid manure. But, but I will say also that we used the front end of that applicator, which had six outlets that came out to actually take a look at the effect of, and this was effectively kind of solid manure that was dribbled on the surface at the effect of uniformity of application of the manure mm -hmm. across a land area. So, and, and Ray adds, because we, every once in a while he's serious, and he said, in sincerity, what about strip-till manure applications? Because that's sort of close to what you're getting to, right, is, is essentially like a strip tillage, so you're putting manure in the strip. Jake, is, is anyone so, out in Ontario going to try that or have already? Yeah, apparently there are, and I've not seen it myself, but we, like at Omafra, we've put on some some strip-till events, and we've done a series of videos and fact sheets, and, and in kind of doing that, we've we we are aware of a small handful of growers who well, I should say there's one grower I'm aware of who's rigged up I believe a liquid manure applicator to his strip till to unit strip -till. and then there's yeah. another who's who's kind of got a more modified like a, a two basically a two pass system where he's he's basically mm -hmm. yeah injecting and then going back and strip strip tilling right on on those bands but uh, yeah. it's a it's a really neat concept um i just haven't seen it done you know at scale with many many producers yeah yeah for sure so one of the other of course um i did pull two clips but didn't didn't run the other one but it is with christine brown with omafra and it's from a couple of years ago it's a corn school it is on our youtube um and uh, it's about using a drag hose on standing corn uh to put i think is liquid hog manure on so this idea of that often so there's a few things with manure that we are concerned about, of course, and that is often it is heavy and we're using, you know, they're heavy loads. Sure, they get lighter as you go, but it's still really heavy. So we are worried about the time of year that we're applying it um, so that so as to minimize compaction. Um, but I want to talk and this is maybe where we'll sort of wrap things up. I want to talk about that infiltration part and the runoff part. So when we are talking livestock manure, of course, we always want to be cognizant. Uh, we want the value of that manure to be where the crop is going to use it, which is on the field. But environmentally, of course, we don't want it to move. So Jeff, what do we need to know about, you know, the infiltration portion and balance that with, with when we're applying manure? Sure. So a lot of the runoff that carries nutrient off of farm fields here in Western Canada is actually snowmelt runoff that moves across the surface of first and of frozen soils and carry soluble phosphorus and nitrogen mm -hmm. with it. And so if we can get that manure put into the soil and isolate it from that surface where the water is flowing across, we can significantly reduce the amount of soluble phosphate and nitrogen in that runoff water. The other thing that we found in some work, we were looking at uh, variable rate solid manure application, uh, GPS linked across uh, fields and watersheds and looking at uh, uh, where those nutrients were we're going and that included looking at uh, export of, of phosphorus in, in runoff water we collected in basins in that field uh, we found that the variable rate application strategy where we eliminated the application of manure right in the center of those depressions or sloughs as we call them in Saskatchewan that were dry at the at the time of application and reduce the rate in the low-lying areas and increase the rate up on the top of the hills those knolls that needed that organic organic matter, we actually saw some slight benefit in terms of reducing the concentration of phosphate in that runoff water. So uh, it was kind of one of the things that we learned uh, uh, in that. And other thing the variable rate did was it helped smooth the crop production out across the landscape. So it kind of cold told us to, you know, keep the crop out of the sloughs. <laughs> there we go. I like it. I'm going to quote you on that one. Um, so, Jake, I guess that's one question uh, here in Ontario. Certainly with eroded knolls, rolling landscapes, those those sorts of things. We we did touch on, you know, at the beginning about physically putting the topsoil that has moved back on. Uh, but I think probably the more common thing would be maybe focusing on manure applications on the more eroded portions. So how are we handling that in Ontario? Is it is it gaining in popularity? 
I, I don't know if I can comment on whether it's gaining in popularity. I think there's more, I think there's more and more awareness all the time on, you know, just, you know, with the value of land and the price of mm -hmm. crops, you know, I think growers are very much one and, and having an eye towards, you know, maximizing productivity, productivity and, and bringing, you know, that's where the most benefit really can be gained is bringing those low producing areas up. Um, yes, there's tweaking, of course, you can do on, on the high producing areas, but I, I feel like in most fields, at least in our, with, with our more complex topography with that history of, you know, tillage and water erosion, bringing that productivity mm -hmm. up in those parts of the field is going to pay dividends. And, and yes, Lindsay, absolutely. That's the, that's kind of the go-to if you have access to some sort of organic amendment, especially a solid organic amendment like compost or, or solid manure, you know, just applying a higher rate. And it sounds like from Jeff, that's, you know, good for the environment too. So yeah, and I think Jeff. that's, that's right, Jake. You know, I think, and always, uh, you know, if it's got uh, nutrients in it and organic matter, you know, that's a candidate for, for land application and uh, to, to look into how we can make benefit of all of these different sources out there. Sometimes that are, and have been sometimes traditionally viewed as a disposal issue, a waste, uh, mm -hmm. a waste yeah. disposal issue and turn them into something valuable as far as a, a source of nutrient and organic matter. Um, just quickly, before we go, Jay, can you bring up uh, Jake's slide nine? Because I, I would be remiss if we didn't bring this up because it's a stunning visual. And Jake, I want you to walk us through it. It's the, uh, yeah, that one. That's the one I'm looking for. Because yeah, we're talking yeah. water infiltration. We're talking about soil moving. Um, and there is a question about side dressing manure. But walk me through, what are we looking at? here because this is just a stunning visual that i so this I wanted yeah to these sure. photos are courtesy of the upper thames region conservation authority so near london ontario and um, i was not actually there at the time but i do remember the spring quite well this was in april of 2017 and it just yep. rained and rained it that never april yeah. yeah and um this is a this is a you know a, a plot that they had looking at the impact of a overwintering cover crop i believe this was cereal rye planted after sweet corn and it was on it was on a fairly sloping you can't quite see from this photo but it was it was pretty steep slope and you can just see after one of those big rain events the the rills that are forming so the water water erosion yeah. that's occurring um, where there's no soil cover versus you know very minimal soil loss and likely much better infiltration especially you know further up the slope where we have uh, live roots and and plant material that's breaking the impact and slowing that water Mm -hmm. So water, water movement, we haven't talked, we didn't talk a ton about it tonight. So I thought, let's at least get this visual. This will stick with you, everyone, uh, because no one likes to see exactly that those like lines of water starting to move and yeah. taking all that valuable topsoil and all those nutrients with it. Um, some great comments as well on uh, side dress manure uh, in row and corn. Um, Jake, I don't know if, if but he, you did share that you do share an office with Christine Brown. So I'm going to guess one of you has done this. So is there some of that work happening inside dressing manure and corn? Oh, I know that Christine has been involved with, with looking at, yeah, in crop side dressing for some time. I, I It's being done by growers in Ontario. Yeah, yeah it, um, I think that uh, that has come a long way in the last number of years, but I'm, I'm no expert. I just know that people are doing it. And, uh, and I think yeah. as a concept, it makes a lot of sense. Yep, absolutely. All right. Okay. We shall leave it there um, as we are out of time. Big thank you, uh, Jeff. Thank you so much, Jake. Um, absolute pleasure to have both of you on. Um, we did not get to even half, I think, of what I wanted to, but what we did cover, I'm glad we did. So, uh, so thank you both very much. I really appreciate your time uh, tonight. And, uh, and of course, everyone in the comments, thank you so much. It's, it's wonderful to get the feedback, the questions, um, lots to think about tonight as well. Um, and, and to our show sponsors, thank you as well to Adam I Canada, FMC Preschool and US Borax. Next week, we're talking canola establishment. Um, and yes, I know in the East, maybe that's not the most exciting thing, but I promise you'll learn something. So there you go. All right. Uh, see everyone next week. Jeff, Jake, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you for coming out, everybody. Cheers, everyone.